Well, for my friends at this orphanage, it means that instead of just going out and seeing all those things, they realized God's hand was on them for it. And they said, well, if his hand is on us, and this is what he's called us to do, hundreds of people have tried to take these kids in. Hundreds of people have tried to have an orphan. Never worked. But if God's hands on us to do it, then we got to try. And they tried it today. 110 kids live there. Birth, all the way until they're adults. 110. You want to go with me? We're going to take a trip down there in March. We just provided a huge Christmas celebration for them. They have food to eat. They have clothes to wear. They have school. They hear about Jesus every single week. And God will take and he'll raise up an army of did you know that that little, that little orphanage literally feeds the whole town's kids? At Christmas time, the kids in the town go to the orphanage to give their toys. And God, he breathed life into it. I, uh, I've had the honor, the privilege, and the pleasure, as well as the horror the sadness of being taken out and some of these places, some of these dry places. And I remember one time in particular, I was a youth pastor up in Lancaster, and I got a phone call from one of my kids in my youth group. She was best friends with these two kids. The boy, a boy and a girl, they were boyfriend and girlfriend, and my girl in my youth group was best friends with both. And that day on their way to school, he was driving in his truck, and he tried to go around all the cars and be, be tricky and he did, got cut back in the light and everything like that. The car clipped him like that. It rolled two or three times and the girl was killed instantly. Instantly. And I spent the rest of that day, half that day, I spent at the boy's house. The boy who didn't know Jesus. The boy where the family didn't know the Lord. And he had just killed his 17-year-old girlfriend just from reckless driving. And I was in that home half a day. And it was despair. It was all despair. It was dry bones. It was, it was as dry as it could be. No hope. But the second half of the day, I stayed at the girl's home with the mother, the single mom, and her other daughter. And here was the girl, the woman who had lost her child. Just lost her child through some foolish accident. But they knew the Lord. They knew the Lord. And the atmosphere in that home was completely different. Completely different. There was hope out of despair. There was death, but life came from that whole thing. Two different, two different places. I remember another time, this happened about a year and a half ago. I had a young girl, a mother called me and said, uh, my daughter needs, she needs to meet with you. I said, well, tell me what's happened. She goes, she's went through one of the most horrible things she could ever go through. She's had it so bad. She said, she needs to come meet with you. And I met with her. Her name is Julie Brindis. And Julie was actually featured not too long ago on a, on a television show on KTLA for what she went through. But basically what had happened was this girl had gotten pregnant at 17 years old. When the daughter was one year old, um, actually the daughter was uh, 11 months old, they just noticed things, something was wrong. It just, something was just not right. She wasn't able to hold her head up very well. She wasn't able to sit up. Different things were happening. And she basically went through a six-month period of time where her daughter just got progressively worse and worse. And she went through about as close to hell on earth as a young girl could go through. And then right before Christmas, um, her little girl breathed her last breath. And she had to, to be there to see her daughter die. To see them try all the life-saving measures on this little, precious little baby. She said they shook her like a rag doll trying to get it to live. And she said, I can't get those images out of my mind. And it was almost eight months later before she came to see me. It was the first time she was able to talk, talk about it. And she said, no one loved the Lord more than me. No one served God more than my family, she said. But I can't hear God right now. And I don't want to talk to God right now. I'm, I'm very angry at God. I don't understand. I don't understand. And that was a low place. And that was a low place. I said that I just wept as she told me her story. And we wept together. And we cried together. And it took her about an hour and a half to say it. And she said everything. So incredibly eloquent. I just couldn't believe it. 
And then God, I looked at God and said, God, this is a low place. I go, these are dry bones. This, there's nothing but death here. There's nothing but, I don't know what to say to her. And in each situation, it comes back to the scripture. And what God says is, he says as he says, prophesy to those dead bones. Prophesy to those dead bones. Speak to those dead bones. Speak life over those dead bones. And so that's just what I tried to do. And it's amazing. As I began to speak life, as I just began to let God tell me what to say, what to do, they were filled with the, the breath of the Holy Spirit, just like it says. And God began to breathe life into them. Later on, I went and I met with her family. Her dad's a fire captain, you know, and, and uh, the sister who hadn't really spoken to anybody since it happened, who was having a really hard time, found out. What had happened is right before the baby died, the mother passed out. She couldn't take it anymore. But the little girl, this little 14-year-old girl, saw it all. She saw everything. She said, they took my little niece. And they just shook her. And they pounded on her. And I screamed, just stop. And she just poured out her heart over what she had seen at 14 years old. And she didn't really want much to do with God either. And we began this process this place, this dry place, this low place, speaking life and prophesying life. And it wasn't long after that, about six months, they didn't even begin to talk to each other for the first time. And it wasn't much later until Katie Lang heard about the story. They had her on a telephone with her story. And you can, you can YouTube it and everything. It's Judy Prendez. Uh, you can see her whole story of what happened. They cut out most of it because they edited it down. But God brought life. Out of bed. I remember another time, I got a picture on my desk in my, in my office of a, a girl named Julie, another girl named Julie. I'll never forget, um, never forget, uh, when she came to me, and, and she was in my English class, I was an English teacher, as a freshman, and then when she was older, I was a dean, and she was in there, she had gotten in trouble for something, and her mother was there, and you're like, we don't know what's going on with her. It's the nicest kid in the whole wide world, never gets in trouble, and all of a sudden, she just shut down. And I just looked at her. And she just looked at me and the tears rolled up in her eyes and she just, she just looked me straight in the eyes. I said, I don't know what, what is it? What's wrong? And she just, she looked down at her hands and her hands were like this. And she reached out to me and so I took her hands and her mom sat right there and then she turned them over like that. And she had cut the word, help me, right through her wrists. Just carved it right in there. And I remember seeing that, and I remember the, the counselor becoming a part of that. And the counselor, he had, she had said, and I got really offended when she said that. She says, well, that typically, son has been some kind of sexual abuse. I thought, oh, I said, you don't understand. This is a great family. You, know, you shouldn't say things like that. You have no right to say anything like that. And then years later, I would learn more about sexual abuse in children, and molestation in teenagers or in children. And I've learned the different signs and the different things. And now kids, when they go through that, many times they will, they'll cut themselves. They'll do things to themselves that you would leave. It's just self-mutilation. Then I met my friend. I, my wife, uh, she had a best friend for years, ever since high school. She was the man of honor at our wedding. And her husband, he was like, uh, he was an uncle to my kids. You know, they called him uncle. And they were our closest friends in the whole world. And, I remember when he finally came to me and, and he said, you know, I got, I got a really serious problem. And uh, I said, what? He's about to lose his family. I said, what's going on? He says, I'm, he goes, I'm not just addicted to pornography. He said, I am so far into this. He goes, he goes, I, he goes there's no life in me left. He goes, I just want to die. I'm going to destroy my family. I'm going to destroy my everything. And I began to walk with him through that. And it was a dry place. And it was a low place. And there was no life there. There was no life. The kids were scared of him. The wife wanted nothing to do with them. But he had told her, if you leave me, I will chop your body into a thousand pieces and will never find one. That's how low he had gotten. I said, good Lord. And he even said to me in the midst of it, he said, I've even done some things I can't tell you. I said, man. So what did you do? You just prophesy 
life. You just begin to speak life. Proverbs says the power of life and death are the tongue. The New Testament says, whatsoever you ask in my name, then I'll do it. So I just begin to speak life. I just begin to speak life. To prophesy life. He starts counseling. That was a hard first step. Takes the next step. They go deeper into more serious counseling. Two years into it, they're going to a support group one night a week. He's got serious counseling that they go to as a couple the other night. Five or still four or five years into it, still the same routine. Their family's been restored. The addiction, it, it, it'll always probably be something that he struggles with, but it's under control. They are now a major, they were a major part of the church and they're growing. And he was a different human being. He was a different human being. Couldn't have given up the word. Couldn't get God's house enough. God did a miracle in his life. Did a miracle in his life. Miracle. Son, my son has just of love for you. He trusts in me as I trust in you. He gets his zest from you. When my son hears his name, he comes running. He wants to see why you call. He wants to see what you want with a happy puppy.